Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back to another episode of the Find Me in the Secret Place podcast with your favorite sister in Christ, Aaliyah Renee. And if I'm not your favorite sister in Christ, that's absolutely okay because you're not gonna see me for a little while because this is the end of season one of the Find Me in the Secret Place podcast. Ah, which means we're taking a break after this episode. Um, yeah, it'll only be three weeks. It's not gonna be anything crazy. So you're missing three episodes. You'll see me on August 5th. And I will be back with another episode. Um, we'll talk about it more at the end of the episode. But as always, if you want to keep up with me, the social medias are down below. I won't be on here, but I will be present online in other forms, most likely. But I'm just slowing down so that I can get a download from the Lord and spend time with him and just be like, just like me and Abba. I just need some me and Abba time. And it's been such a fun journey. I looked and since March 1st, which is when we started posting consistently, we've been running for 18 weeks, 21 episodes because in March we were having double uploads. So it's been blessed. And if you want to just continue to stay tapped in, um, go back into other words, I'll link the stuff down below, but we'll talk about that a little later. What I want to get to most importantly, is the word for today. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit today. I'm so excited. The Holy Spirit and more specifically being a good steward of the Holy Spirit has been something that God has really been working with me on for honestly the past like three weeks. It has really been a desire of my heart to um, be a good vessel for the Holy Spirit. So what we're going to do in this episode is we're going to learn a little bit about the Holy Spirit and who he is. Um, And then we're also going to talk about where the Holy Spirit used to dwell. And then what happened when Jesus came? Because Jesus just came and he just turned everything around. He, Jesus does a wonderful job of just turning things upside down. And I'm really here for it. So we're going to read about what happened to the Holy Spirit when Jesus came and how the Holy Spirit lived within us and is living in us right now. And then we're going to look through the word and understand a little bit better about how we can be good stewards of the spirit of God that lives within us. And I think a lot of us feel distant from the Lord because we're not good stewards of his spirit that lives within us. Um, There are things that we can do to grieve the spirit. There are things that we can do to feel distant from the Holy Spirit. But the Bible is such an amazing love letter from the Lord. He's like, I'm I'm not going to leave you stranded. I'm going to tell you what you need to do in order to hear my voice in a fresh rhema word, if that's what he desires of you, or in the Logos word where the Holy Spirit just just points things out into the Bible. And I feel like we as a generation of Christians in these last days should put an emphasis on the importance of walking in the presence of the Lord daily. And a lot of the times we miss out on the intimacy with God because we mishandle his spirit. So I'm really excited to not only learn who the Holy Spirit is, which is, spoiler alert, the spirit of God that lives within us, and how we can be good stewards of the Holy Spirit so we can live steeped in a in a lifestyle of being in the presence of the Lord. But before we get started, I am going to practice what I preach and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us as we um, dive into the scripture. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And if not, just focus on Jesus. Um, hi, Jesus. Hi, Lord. I love you so, so, so much. You are so awesome and amazing. Oh, Jesus, I want to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is with us. I want to acknowledge that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwells within each and every disciple, each and every believer. It is part of our inheritance. Along with salvation, you have given us a, a direct lifeline to the Holy Spirit. And I want to say thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here with us. Awaken within us, O Lord God, for us who have been uh, neglectful to the Holy Spirit or have felt dull to the Holy Spirit. I ask Jesus that you would just awaken our senses to the Spirit spirit of the Lord that lives within us. And I ask that you would literally wreck us with the Holy Spirit, that you would be so potent while we listen to this episode and watch this episode, that you would just dwell with us eternally, O Lord Jesus. Lord, as we go through your word, help us to understand where we may be falling short, where we may not be good vessels and temples to hold the spirit of God, O Lord Jesus. And as you do so, let us be receptive and open to correction um, and open to guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's get started. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. I'm super duper excited. So the first thing that we're going to do is establish who the Holy Spirit is. Now, we're just going to establish right off the bat, Genesis 1 verse 2. It tells us that the Spirit of God hovered over the void of the earth. That is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God 
or God in spirit. Um, and one thing that we have to understand in terms of the history of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God did not dwell in us always. If we go to Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2, we can see that at the time in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God only dwelt in the temple of God that was consecrated for uh, the presence of God to dwell. Now, when we think about the temple, um, going back to like the original temple of the Israelites, it was designed in such a way that in the innermost part of the temple, there was a place called the Holy of Holies or the Holies of Holy. And this was separated off by a veil. And this is where the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit would dwell. And it says in Leviticus chapter 16, verse two, and the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place, this Holy of Holies, um, inside the veil before the mercy seat that is set on the ark so that he may not die for i will appear in a cloud over the mercy seat so we see that the holy spirit is dwelling in the form of a cloud in this very specific place this holy place and we also see that this holy place was separated by a veil and the cherry on top of this is god only allowed for aaron which was part of a priest a levitical line a levite line of priests to enter into the space of the Holy Spirit or God's Spirit at specific times. So I want us to remember this veil and this place of the Holies of Holies because for all of the Old Testament, before Jesus comes and dies for us on the cross, the Israelites and every nation that interacted with them as they knew it, knew that the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God dwelt in this Holy of Holies, dwelt in this place, and did not dwell among the people And you really had to come correct when you were entering into the holies of holies. When you're entering into the place of the Lord, those who were Levites, this priesthood that was responsible for taking care of the temple and also responsible for almost being a liaison to to um, maintain the presence of the Lord. They had to be clean. They were they were a consecrated, set apart line of Israelites and they were responsible for Uh, sacrificing and they were the only ones really allowed to enter into the presence of the lord um and i really love that we see that the spirit of god was so sacred to the children of israel where they literally would have to come correct they would put bells and like a rope around the priests so that if they pass out or they die in the presence of of god and in where his holy spirit dwelled in the holy of holies that they could drag them out like it was so important to be consecrated and essentially to be clean when entering into the presence of the lord and now we have to understand that that same potent presence lives within us but how? Okay, good question. Let's keep going. So here we are in Leviticus in the Old Testament. We see that only the priests were allowed to enter into the holies and holies, and thus they were the only ones that were allowed to enter into God's presence, presence where his spirit dwelt. Um, and they had to come correct. And we see this emphasized in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. I love Hebrews 9 and 10. I think that's like really good homework to read, where you can sort of see a painted picture of how humanity interacted with god before the graceful gift of jesus's life and how um how they interacted after and we're also going to stay in hebrews to understand how we can dwell with the spirit now so if we go to hebrews chapter 9 it's going to paint even more of a picture to us um in terms of dwelling with the lord before jesus came So before the covenant of Jesus came, there was an earthly sanctuary and a tabernacle was set up in this room and it's explaining the room. It had a lampstand, it had bread, and this was called the holy place. Remember this holy place spoken about in Leviticus 16. And behind the curtain in the room, behind that veil was the most holy place. It held the Ark of the Covenant. Um, It held a golden jar of manna. It held Aaron's staff, stone tablets of the covenant um, being the commandments. And there was the glory of the Lord that was over that place. And in verse six, it said, when everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry out their ministry. Verse seven, but only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year and never without blood or a sacrifice. So a sacrifice was needed, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people that had committed uh, in ignorance. So we see here in, in Hebrews, it's also showing us that They couldn't dwell with the Lord every day, which is such a contrast to what we see now where the priest could only come at certain times of the year and they had to come 
after a sacrifice to enter into the presence of the Lord. But the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he was a sacrifice that was needed for us so that we could enter into the presence of the Lord and dwell with the Lord at all times because he was the ultimate sacrifice. Each time that the priest wanted to enter into the presence of the Lord in this inner room, we see that it was never without blood. It was never without a sacrifice, but praise God for Jesus Christ because when he came, he died and his blood was shed for once and for all to atone for our sins so that we could enter into this holy place forever and ever and dwell with the Lord's spirit, this Holy Spirit forever. Okay, you're following me? We're going. All right, so how did Jesus do this and how do we know that Jesus was this final sacrifice? Well, something really amazing happens. If you remember in, in Leviticus 16, verse two, right? We're learning about where the God, where God's spirit would dwell, where the Holy Spirit would dwell. It would be in the Holy of Holies in this holy place that was behind the veil of a temple. So we see here something significant happens when Jesus dies, that a veil of the temple that blocked the holies of holies from the rest of the temple was torn at Jesus's death. Don't believe me? Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 to 51. It says here in verse 50, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, which means that he died. Verse 51, at that moment, the the curtain or the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tomb broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. What an amazing scene, like literally earthquakes and rocks are splitting and like tombs are breaking open and plus you're seeing dead people being raised because of the power of Jesus, the righteous being resurrected. Insane. But part of this, in the midst of all this, let's really focus on 51. And at a moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That is symbolic of this veil, this curtain that blocks the holy place, which held God's spirit, which held the Holy Spirit and separated it, right, from the rest of mankind due to their sin. Remember, it took a blood sacrifice to enter into the presence of the holies of holies, and that needed to be done every time because the blood of one lamb would never be able to consecrate all the sins of the world. There would always have to be a lamb sacrifice before entering. But praise God for the lamb of God who is Jesus Christ. Because when he died and his blood was shed, it was symbolic that there never needed to be another sacrifice to enter into the presence of God because he was the ultimate sacrifice. So why we even need the veil? The veil tore. And that was symbolic of the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There is no separation because his blood consecrated any blood is more superior than any blood of a quail or a lamb or a goat or a bull that was done in order to enter into the presence of God because he is God who became man, who shed his blood so that we could dwell with God forever. So when the veil is torn, it's beautiful because now there's this point of separation that was once there for generations that Jesus does in a moment when he gives up the spirit and his blood is shed. That blood sacrifice breaks every single boundary that was there to the presence of the Holy Spirit, to God. And Jesus had already told us that he would give us the Holy Spirit before he goes, before he died. Jesus tells his disciple in John um chapter 14. Let's go to verse 16 here. John chapter 14, verse 16, it says, and I will ask the father, this is Jesus, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth being the Holy Spirit, God's spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be with you. That's verse 16 and 7. Let's jump to verse 26 and 27. I hope you're enjoying this Bible study. We got a lot of scripture. So verse 26, it says, but the advocate, this is still in John 14, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So we see that even before Jesus dies, before this veil was torn, he's reminding his disciples that our inheritance with walking with him when we accept salvation is this Holy Spirit. And I want us to take a pause because sometimes when we enter into Christianity, we we receive the spirit of God that lives within us, but we forget the reverence that was once had for the spirit of God. 
if you read the old Testament, if you read any time before Jesus, if somebody was coming in the presence of the Lord and it was not correct, they would literally be struck down. And sometimes we take advantage of the Holy Spirit that lives within us for some of the things that we do when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God lives within us, a priest would never even dare because they had such a reverence for the Holy Spirit. And I feel like as our generations go on, as Christians, we can get so desensitized to these things that were so revered by the disciples or so revered by those Levitical priests. Like when it comes, think about it. Jesus makes a sacrifice an innocent sacrifice sheds his blood for you. Earthquakes happen, a veil is torn, and the spirit of God, which once dwelled in one spot, this is the spirit of God, the same spirit of God from Genesis 1-2, which hovered over the waters. The same spirit, of, this is God's literal, like, this is God's literal spirit, okay? It's not your conscience. It's not like a little voice in your head. This is God's literal spirit that lives within us, and we lose the reverence for it. And there's so many times in my life, especially before I reconsecrated my life to the Lord, where I would be like, okay, whatever. It's the Holy Spirit. Like, no, the Holy Spirit is not just, oh, Holy Spirit. It's literally God spirit. It's God in spirit that lives within us. That was once at a point were so revered that they had to sacrifice and give a blood offering every single time they entered into the presence of the Lord. Do you know how costly that is? The fact that Jesus had to give his life for the spirit of God to live within you. And we take it for granted. We don't even, we literally just do whatever we want as the spirit of God lives within us. And it costed a life for God to live within us. It costed bloodshed for God to live within us. But we take it for granted. We're like, oh, the Holy Spirit's there. And it's just like an addition to my conscience. And I don't really need to listen to the Holy Spirit. And it's cool or whatever. But, oh, the Holy Spirit's annoying because it's bringing me conviction about things. And trying to, and the Lord is trying to guide me. And, and he's speaking to me through the Holy Spirit. But we don't even check how important and how revered the Spirit of God was in the Bible. Which is why I love when we look at the Bible as a whole. It paints an amazing picture for us. And the more that I read levitical law and the more that i read what the levites had to do and the more that i read the punishments that came when you played with god's spirit it reminded me oh wait this isn't just the right so remember last time we said this is not just pages right filled with letters this is literally like the word of god and once you realize that you realize like oh wait these were real people that had to come correct for God. And that same God and that same spirit that dwelled in holy places now dwells within me. And now I'm called to be a vessel for that. I'm called to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit. I'm called to be a vessel that God dwells in every day. Am I a vessel worthy of God to dwell in every day? Because that's your inheritance. When you're saved, when you're a disciple, when you become a believer of Jesus Christ, he already tells us he's going to give us a helper, the spirit of truth. He's going to give us the Holy Spirit, our advocate, which the Father will send to dwell within us. So you don't really have a choice. Once, you, once you're part of this family, you're getting the Holy Spirit. You're getting the spirit of God that lives within you. Are you operating in such a way that is worthy of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe to dwell in. Is your temple, is your conduct, is the things that you're doing worthy of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you? And that's a sobering conversation to have because it's like sometimes I'll think like the Holy Spirit is just like something playing the backseat in my life. No, this is literally God living in you. Are you living in a way that would please God if he was with you? Because he is with you. Like those, the saying that goes like, mm, if Jesus was in the room, would Jesus like what you're doing? If he was in the room, he is in the room. The spirit of God dwells within you at all times. He sees what you see. He walks where you walk. He's around and sees how you interact and carry yourself. When you gossip, he's there. When you drink, he's there. When you're smoking, he's there. When you're lying, he's there. When you're being lazy, he's there. When you're complacent, he's there. He's there at all times. The same God that a blood sacrifice, literally someone had to die for this Holy Spirit that lives within us that we take for granted so much. Crazy. Literally crazy. And the good thing is, if we feel like we are not being good stewards, the Bible helps us. Okay, the Bible helps us out. It tells us what we need to do and we're gonna get there. But before we do, 
Let me just reiterate the point that we are now the new homes of the Holy Spirit. Okay, going to 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to go to verse 5 and then skip down to verse 9. This passage shows us that we are both temples of the Holy Spirit, right? Because the Holy Spirit needs somewhere to dwell. Instead of dwelling in the holies of holies, we become the holies of holies. Our, we are now vessels of the Holy Spirit. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. And because the temple of old no longer holds the Holy Spirit, those Levitical priests are no longer needed. Instead, now we become the new priest. So those same Levites that would go and make sure they were consecrated, that they were set apart from others because they were interacting with the spirit of God. In the same way, we are called to be a priesthood that's sanctified, consecrated, and making sure we are coming correct because we're literally having daily dealings with God. They need to make sure they were clean, they were covered, they were wearing the right things, they were doing the right things they did not eat, they were were making sure they were in right standing and not sinning with the Lord. That's what the Levites had to do to spend time with the Lord. And in the same way, when the Holy Spirit dwells in us as vessels, we're called to be a new priesthood. Let's go to 1 Peter 2. It says in verse 5, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. My Bible tells me that by spiritual house, If you look at that root Hebrew word, it means a home for or a temple for the Holy Spirit. So let's replace that. Let's go back. Verse five, you also like living stones are being built into a temple for the Holy Spirit, a temple for the Spirit of God to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So in the same way where the Levites had to be a holy priesthood, set apart and offer sacrifices, we are called to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to the Lord through Jesus Christ. Verse 9 reiterates this in 1 Peter 2. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are now the new Levitical priesthood, we are now the priests, okay? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in us as temples, so we need to be good stewards of our temple. And as it says in verse five, sometimes it takes sacrifice, offering spiritual sacrifices. Jesus has given the ultimate sacrifice, but sometimes there's things that we need to sacrifice that are acceptable to God so that we can usher in his presence even deeper. The Holy Spirit will never leave us. He is our inheritance. The spirit of God will rest upon us all of our days. But one thing that we need to understand, if we want to enter into the deepest, most intimate parts of the presence of God, it's going to be costly. It's going to cost us things. I was watching, trying to watch Love Island. Okay. I was trying to watch Love Island. This will be the first year that I don't watch Love Island USA. Last year, I watched it all the way to the the top. Okay. I, Hannah and somebody when I remember them, like I was locked in. But I had to offer a sacrifice because when I was watching Love Island, I was spending way too much time watching it online. I was staying up until three. I wasn't reading my Bible time. And this was all in the span of like a day where it was like one day I'm like, I'm going to watch Love Island. And instead of like really dedicating time to Bible time, I watched Love Island. And because of this, the presence of the Lord that dwelt within me, it used to be like, think of it like this. I used to be uppercase, then it was lowercase because Instead of offering the sacrifice of my time and my attention and consecrating myself because I'm the spiritual house for the Lord, I'm a temple for the Holy Spirit, I was being distracted by other things that didn't matter. And I wasn't being a good priest. I wasn't being a good steward. If you think about it, like literally like the Holy Spirit lives within us. We are now like apartments. We are now apartments where the Holy Spirit dwells in. And we're also landlords because we have to make sure that that apartment is good. We got to make sure the water's running and the heat is on and the electricity works and the internet's good and all the things. So if we are neglectful landlords to our tenant, which is the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit not going to be enjoying itself living inside of you. And in the same way where, where landlords have legal obligations to make sure these things are right for their tenants, we have a legal obligation in this covenant with Jesus that we make sure that the temple that the Holy Spirit lives in, our body, is fit. Because we are now these new landlords. We are the priesthood that's responsible for taking care of the temple. And it's really that serious. Like at first I'm like, oh, it's not that. No, it is. It says it biblically that we are now the new homes of the Holy Spirit. We are now a priesthood that are supposed to offer spiritual sacrifice. Like it says it plain in the word. It is that serious. And we don't take it serious. We really think that the Holy Spirit is just a sprinkle of our conscience. 
when it's literally the voice of God that dwells within us. And we wonder why we don't hear from God. We wonder why when we read the Bible, we're so uninspired because the inspiration that wrote this Bible is the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us, the writer of the Bible tells us that all of these words were inspired by the Spirit of God that lives within us. So how am I trying to understand what the Spirit wrote when I'm not tapped in with the Spirit at all? That's why we're confused and we feel like we read the Bible and we don't receive revelation because we're not tapped into the literal author and inspirer of the word, the spirit of God that lives within us when we get into the word. But we don't get to that. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19 to 20. This reiterates this idea that we're a temple. I really just want to build us up in the idea that the word of God not only gives us this beautiful reverential view of the spirit of God when we think about how it dwelt in the holies of holies with the Levites then Jesus comes he pays the ultimate sacrifice it literally costed a life for the spirit of God to live within you and now we see not only in first Peter but we're also going to see in first Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 to 20 that we're the temples of the Holy Spirit Here it says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have received from God you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Ah, here's the, here's the, here's the, the, here's the part that we don't really like. Okay. Some of us are very open to the idea like, yes, I have received the Holy Spirit. Give me, give me, give me. I have the spirit of God in me. But what comes with that is you are not your own. Just like when an apartment, when you sign a lease for a year, that's it. You lock down. It's yours. You can put up pictures if you want. You can do whatever you want. I could put a blue couch in here. I could put an orange couch in there because this apartment is not the landlord's anymore. In legality, the apartment belongs to me as long as this lease term is. So whatever I want to move in, I can move in. Whatever I want to take out, I can take out. And in the same way, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. So we're, a lot of us are open to like, yes, Holy Spirit, come in and talk to me. I want that rhema word, like speak to me every day. But when the word that the Lord is trying to give you through his spirit that lives within you is telling you to change things, you don't want to, but we forget we're bought with the price. You are not your own. You were bought with the price. We lose autonomy here, which is why the scriptures and Jesus tells us to die to our flesh because our flesh is going to be the one that wants us to do contrary to the spirit. But the spirit that lives within us owns us now. God owns us because we were bought with the price. We were bought with the price of of Jesus Christ. And this can be so weighty and people don't want to talk about this because they're like, what do you mean I I can't do whatever I want? No, you can't. Once you accept being a Christian, once you accept this gift of salvation and eternal life and you accept the Holy Spirit, he, he got the lease, girl. So if he wants to take the blue couch out and put the orange couch and if he wants to paint the walls, he can because you were bought with the price. He paid rent. He paid rent for the rest of your life. He's locked in. He's a forever tenant and he's able to move around and do whatever he wants. Therefore, honor God with your bodies in what you say, in what you do, in what you allow in, in what you allow out. Because you were bought with the price. You are not your own. You are temples of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 6. Let's actually lock that in our brains. Like, let's actually tap into the fact that, like, we are not our own. And to some of us, that might seem unfortunate because we live in a world where my body, my choice. But actually, it's not. It's the Holy Spirit's body. God bought you with the price of his son. So it's not your body. It's not your choice. When we live, we die to flesh. We die to self. Like, this is biblical. Like, these are Bible. Like, I think it's really just clicking in my brain. Because I've been on a pathway of surrender, but some of us are are willing to surrender up until a certain point. But surrender means fully in totality, like 100%. You can't pick and choose surrender. Surrender means absolutely everything. Imagine an army surrendering and there's three people that are like, actually, never mind. No, we don't surrender. That's not surrender. Everybody must bow. Every has Every part of you has to wave the white flag and surrender because your whole body was bought with a price. Whether that be your your sexuality whether that be your sexual expression because those are like things that really enter into our temple whether that be your gossiping or your anger or your your tendency to lie or your laziness your complacency your distraction 
you're bought with a price. So all those things have to be surrendered and our lives now stepping into this new covenant with Jesus Christ as a spirit of God, the Holy Spirit lives within us. We have to honor our God with our bodies. And the way that we do that is through the killing of our flesh and our desires and saying, Lord, what do you want to do? A landlord is not coming up in your house like, oh, you should have painted the walls green or, oh, you shouldn't have bought this couch. The landlord literally says, here, do whatever you want to do because you've paid it. Even deeper than the landlord, the Holy Spirit bought the house. Holy Spirit bought the house. So you may have thought that you've built it, but he lives within us now. So he gets full reign on what we do. So when the Holy Spirit speaks, we have to listen. We're going to go to our main scripture for today, which is Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 15. And this is going to give us the rundown of what it means to have the Holy Spirit dwell within us. And it's also going to call us to change. Okay, so let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 5. It's a lot of scripture today, and this is my favorite thing ever. I love scripture. So let's go to verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live accordant, in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. Stop. Let's ask ourselves, are your desires what the spirit desires? Are your wants what, what the spirit wants? What are your instincts? Like, do you desire to do things that that edify your spirit, edify the spirit of God? Do you have a desire to dwell in the Lord's presence in worship, in praise, in prayer, in Bible reading? Or are your desires to be distracted? Are your desires contrary to what the spirit would want? And that's why we can't live according to the flesh. We have to put death to the flesh to live according to the spirit. And that means a surrender. But that's because your body's not your own. Like Christianity has been glamorized so much and it is a blessing to be a disciple of God to receive this salvation to walk with him daily but in order to really feel the fullness of what it means to be a disciple and to be under the covenant this new covenant of God is surrender it's literally giving God all of your desires from day to day even like your wants to watch love island you got to give it to him and if the Holy Spirit convicts you and says, I don't want you to watch that. I, you're, you're bought with the price of your body is not your own. Okay, Holy Spirit. And that comes with the crushing that Jesus already warned us there's a dying to self. So do you see how the word has already like prepared us for this? But when we're ignorant or willfully ignorant to what the Lord is saying, saying we can really cruise through life. We can be like, okay, the Holy Spirit's grieved. I can feel the groaning of the Holy Spirit inside of me, which comes with like this, for me, it's like a pit in my stomach. It's a heaviness in my heart where he's like, daughter, what are you doing? Like I'm here with you as you're sinning and doing these things that are contrary to my word and what I've told you to do. But some of us, and there was a, a period in my life where I was living in sin and I was like, I'm okay with grieving the Holy Spirit. Like I built a tolerance to his grief. I built a tolerance to him tugging at me saying, stop, what are you doing? Because I was walking in accordance and I had my mind set on what the flesh desired. I was not living in accordance with the spirit. And when I started to dedicate my life and and live according to the spirit, there were so many things that I did that were blatant sin or things that were hindrances that the Holy Spirit was like, okay, now are you ready to surrender those things to me? Now are you ready to let those things go? Because your life is not your own. So keep going. I'm going to start at verse 5 again. Let's really hammer it in. Romans 8 verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God yikes like actually big yikes so when we are in the realm of the flesh when we are walking out our own fleshly desires we are unable to please the lord so no matter how much you serve in ministry no matter how much you post on tiktok about how god is so amazing no matter how much you read a scripture if when it comes down to it you are serving your flesh you're living in the realm of the flesh in that your mind is governed by the desires of your flesh when your flesh is like i'm lustful i want to watch porn you do it When your mind is saying this fleshly desire, I'm going to cut somebody out, you do it. When your mind is like, I'm going to have sex with someone, you do it. No matter who it is, no matter what it is, you do it. You cannot please God because you are in the realm of the flesh. 
And I was in a period of life where I was in the realm of the flesh, but my works on Sunday and my works on Wednesday night Bible study was everything that religiously would look good. But my mind was still in accordance with my flesh where on every other moment where I wasn't in church, even in moments where I was in church, just not in front of other people, I was living in accordance to the flesh and I knew it wasn't pleasing to God. Crazy. But here we see a reminder in chap- in verse nine, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh but you're in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives within you. So we have to remind ourselves that even though we are walking in the realm of the flesh, there's always still hope. There's always still hope because we're not called to be in the realm of the flesh when we become disciples of Jesus Christ. And it's never too late. If you're looking at your life and like, oh my goodness, my desires are racked by my flesh. My thoughts are governed by my flesh. Whatever my flesh tells me to do, I do it. It's never too late. And it's so beautiful because Christ dies for us. He gives us the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit is able to empower us. It says in verse 11, the Holy Spirit will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives within you. Verse 12, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. An obligation means an act or a conduct you are morally or legally bound to, right? We talk about these covenants where when we enter into the covenant of Jesus, Covenants are legally binding. There's obligation. So an obligation of this covenant of the Holy Spirit living within you, an obligation of us becoming these new temples and vessels of the Holy Spirit is an obligation not to the flesh to live according to it, but to live according to the Spirit. It says in verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body and you will live. So what it's saying here in verse 13 is that we need to change our conduct. We need to move from living according to the flesh and fleshly desires and just caring about me, 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 my body, my choice, my this, my that. I can do whatever I want whenever I want to. That's a mind governed by flesh. Into walking into the realm of killing and putting to death the misdeeds of your body, of your flesh, and then you will live. You will live because you're giving the spirit full autonomy. And the only way that you can give God full reign and autonomy in your life is if you kill all of, all of yours. The only way that you're able to let God run free and reign free in your life and he has a purpose and plan for me and he has trust in the Lord with all your heart and he's ordering my steps in order for that to happen, in order for you to hear the word of the Lord and I want to hear Jesus speak to me and I want to feel his presence. That is contingent on you literally dying to self. That is contingent on you waking up each day and saying, Lord, I'm surrendering every thought that I have to you this day. And even in your repentance, you now are moving beyond repentance and saying, Holy Spirit, I'm letting you take control. The thoughts that I have, I surrender them to you. The desires that I have, oh my goodness. You know how many desires I have that I just want to act out on immediately? Not even things that are like cynical or like super sinful, but literally just like desires that I have. Like I want to do something. I want to lie. I want to gossip. I want to cuss somebody out. I want to be lustful. I want to be promiscuous. There are some times where those thoughts appear in my, in my mind where the flesh is tempted to govern my mind. And that leads to death. It says the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. I want life and peace. I don't want death because I've been in a place where my mind was governed by the flesh, as it said in verse six, and it led to my death, my spiritual death, my physical death in the sense of like literally things that I said I would never do. It literally was so draining where I felt like I was dying. The depression being so great where it was like, oh my goodness, like I feel like I'm the walking dead. So if we want life, verse 13, live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you want the life and peace that's promised by the, by the spirit, living by this Holy Spirit that lives within, within us, we have to put to death our flesh. Flesh being sarks, this Greek word that literally is your animalistic nature, everything that's opposite to the spirit in order for the Holy Spirit to work in you, to move in you. You have to not only listen to the Holy Spirit when he speaks, but you have to put to death the flesh, which is everything opposite to the Holy Spirit. Because the flesh will be so loud sometimes because we've allowed it to do whatever it wants because we're we're just like so impulsive and spontaneous in sin that we don't even think of what we're doing and the consequences that we have, where the Holy Spirit's voice will still be speaking, but the flesh is so loud because we've allowed it to be so loud. We've given it such a place to govern our minds 
that we haven't given it the Holy Spirit even a even a place for 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 him to influence us because we're so influenced and governed and driven by the flesh that we are so disconnected and deceived in the sense that we're close to the Holy Spirit when when we're walking in the flesh that's everything but the truth. But the beautiful thing is Romans 12 verse 2 tells us to not conform to the world which is my body my choice my flesh led by the desires but be transformed by the renewing of your mind which is through the spirit that you may prove that good and that acceptable and perfect will of God. And the will of God for us is that he wants to give us life through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. But we have to get back to a place of remembering we need to stay consecrated. We need to get back to a place to remembering like God is our first love. And when we love him, John 14, 15, keep his commands. And in the keeping of the commands of the Lord, we're able to, to please the spirit of God that lives within us. And the spirit of God will give us peace in life. And we're also promised these fruits of the spirit in Galatians 2 verse uh, 20, Galatians 5 verse 22 to 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against all these things, there's no law. Like we want to be more patient. We want to be more loving. We wonder why we don't have patience and love and kindness towards others. We wonder why we struggle with these basic fundamentals of the spirit and that's because we've let our our flesh run rampant for so long the spirit isn't able to produce fruit because the flesh has been so loud and some of us may feel like oh my gosh how can i fulfill this because i remember when i was away from the lord and i wanted to and i wanted to increase my relationship with the holy spirit i was like oh my gosh i'm sinning so much i don't know i feel so weak there's no way that i can do this on my own skipping down from to, for romans uh chapter 8 verse 26 to 28 it says in the same way the spirit helps us in our weakness so if you're looking at your life and you're like oh my goodness i'm doing so much things that are driven by the flesh and the desires god hates me he doesn't hate you because the same spirit that we've been neglecting that lives within us that we haven't let speak if we allow for the holy spirit and the spirit of god to run free in us it will help us in our weakness and our fleshly weakness but we just need to be willing the beautiful thing we do not let's continue we do not know what we ought to pray for sometimes we don't know where to start Sometimes we literally are like, okay, Lord, I'm dealing with all of these desires that I've let my flesh run free. I feel like your spirit is so far from me. I don't know where to start. You know what's great? The spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groanings. Where things where we can't even articulate, when we allow the Holy Spirit to run free, when we take the first step and start to really deconstruct our lives and remove the 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 grip that our flesh has on us and we let the spirit, the Holy Spirit run free, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groanings that we can't even understand. Verse 27, he searches our hearts, knowing the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Remember what it says in Romans uh, 12 verse 2, we're, we're doing this, we're transforming our minds so we can prove the perfect will of God. That Holy Spirit is also interceding for us in order to be in accordance with the will of God. Like everything works together. And sometimes we just need to trust God enough to let go of the things that have been holding us. Because when we've walked in the flesh for so long, we can be comfortable in our sin. We can be comfortable in our lifestyle. We can be comfortable in, in the way that our minds were. So not transformed, so not surrendered. So when it's like, I have to surrender to the Lord, what does that even mean? How do I start? Bring to the Lord your weakness. Because in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. He will search our heart and he will put us in accordance with God's will. That comes with this, like literally the spirit can be a still small voice that literally is like, you want to sin and have this impulse. The Holy Spirit is saying, no, just, just listen to the Holy Spirit and he'll begin to intercede for us, God's people in accordance with the will of God. The more that we walk out our lives in tune with the spirit and putting death to the flesh is the more that we can act out and begin to see the painted will that God has for us. We all pray for, I want a plan, and, I have a plan and purpose for God. He has, he has plans for me to prosper and not to perish, da, 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 da. But if we're walking in the flesh, there's no way that that will of God that he has for us, the purpose of God that he has for us can be enacted out. Because the only way that that can happen is when the spirit intercedes for God, God's people so that we can be in accordance with the will and purpose that we brag about and we, we quote these scriptures. But it starts with a submission of our of ourselves to the spirit so the spirit can run free it can be strong in our weakness 
and then it can intercede for God's people. Intercede for us in accordance with the will of God that we always brag about. Sorry, verse 28, we'll end here. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, right? So we have been called, we're in this new covenant with the Lord and it's gonna hurt, but know that all things work together for the good of those who love him. This comes from, and like keeping it in context, it comes from us allowing the spirit to reign in our weakness. That is when God is able to work all things for our good. He's able to work on our minds where there have been addictions that I've had, like an addiction to pornography. I was thinking about it. I'm like, oh my gosh, going back to like, this time two years ago, I never thought that my mind would be renewed. I thought that I would be dealing with that addiction forever. But the moment that I had really intended within myself to say, okay, I literally started off with a week that said every single thing, every single thing that my flesh wants to do, I'm going to say no to every single thing that the Holy Spirit wants me to do. I'm going to say yes. It started off as a week. Then it turned into two. Then it turned into a month, six weeks, nine months. And now we're here months, months later, almost a year later two years later where I'm free from addictions that I never thought I would be, but it started with a killing of the flesh. It started from moving from a place that said those who live according to the flesh have their mindset on the, what the flesh desired and me just doing whatever I wanted and all my impulses to taking a second to say, Lord, is this a view? And if it's blatantly not, it's a no. And Lord, what do you want me to do instead? Like those are the conversations that I'm having with the Lord because remember the Holy Spirit lives within me. The Spirit of God lives within me. So I could be like, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God that lives within me. Is this what you want me to do? And see the more that you invite him into your situations, the more that he'll enter. The more that you're literally like, Holy Spirit, just be with me today. Holy Spirit, I'm washing dishes, just dwell with me. When I'm at work, I'm feeding my fish. Holy Spirit, just be with me as I feed the fish. I don't got to listen to no fancy worship music or be saying no, no fiery tongue prayers or be reading the Bible to encounter the Holy Spirit. I'm literally just like in a place where I put death in my flesh and in place of my flesh ruling my mind, I say, Holy Spirit, enter. You rule my mind here. I'd read a book um, by Brother Lawrence that said the practice of God's presence. And I think it's amazing. This is like my first book recommendation. I really recommend it. It's really short. It's a little tiny book. I definitely recommend that you read it and I'll link it down below. It's a beautiful book that just talks about Brother Lawrence and his life where he would literally just invite the Holy Spirit everywhere. And he reiterates the same things of like putting to death those desires of your flesh and literally just being like, Holy Spirit, be with me. Sometimes we feel distant from God, but we haven't even invited the Holy Spirit. We haven't even said, come be with me. And we're like, where's God? Where's God? Did you invite him? where's God? I just don't feel him. I don't see him. Did you welcome him? When you wake up, are you like, Holy Spirit, come alive and dwell with me. Speak to me today. Do we ask for these things that we're complaining about that we don't hear from God? We don't understand his word. The Holy Spirit was the inspiration that wrote the word. So I'm going to talk to the author and be like, Hey, Holy Spirit, I need help. I don't understand this. Bring me clarity or direct me to materials or direct me to other scriptures that can help me. And we like really downplay the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of the living God that lives within us. We literally have the spirit of the Lord. Like that's, that's crazy. Our Abba Father, spirit of God lives within us. And we don't even invite the spirit of God to dwell in our daily doings. And we wonder why we're like so stressed out because we're letting the spirit of our flesh, the spirit of stress take over us where we're not like, Holy Spirit, I'm going to enter an interview. I need you to be with me. Before you even say, Lord, get me this job and let me do good on the interview. Literally start with Holy Spirit, be with me. Because then the Holy Spirit, like it says here in Romans 8 verse 26, 27, he'll be able to intercede for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So if we're in a situation where we want the will of God to be enacted, before you start saying, Lord, I want this man. Lord, I want this woman. Lord, I want this job. Lord, I want to move here. Lord, I want to go to this school. Start with Holy Spirit, be with me. So that as it says in Romans 8, verse 27, he'll search our heart and be, and the spirit will be able to intercede for us so that God's will can be done in our life in every single moment, every single opportunity, every single job, every single career that you want, every single relationship, but it starts with the Holy Spirit. So that's what I have for you today. That's what I have for you for the end of season one of the Find Me in the Secret Place podcast. It has been such a blessing to dwell in the secret place with you all. And I really just want to say thank you for being my brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Um, it means more than you know. And I'm just excited to dwell with the Lord just like one-on-one -on -one because I feel like I'd be sharing my plates with y'all. Like, you know, when you get a plate and someone like, oh, what, what you eating? You know, and then you give them a little piece of chicken or a little piece of fish fry. Yeah, that's what it feels like sometimes. And this is a good thing because I love sharing what the word, um, what the Lord is speaking to me. Because this is a passion of mine that I didn't even know that I had. Just like a desire to like talk about Jesus with amazing people and just like build a community of people who just want to serve God and be consecrated. Like find me in the secret place. Transformation, vulnerability, communion with God. That's what I want. And I think sometimes I feel the pressure of like in my own quiet time to be like, oh, maybe this is for, maybe, maybe this is for the pod. And just being able to have time to dwell into God's word where he could just download it into me and like, no, this is your plate. You get the chicken and the fries and the salad on the side that you didn't even want to really eat. You finna eat it all. You're not giving it to no one else. So I really appreciate y'all. Like it means a lot. And like I said, we had, I think from since March 1st, 21 episodes, 18 weeks. I never missed a week. So I'm missing three. Okay. Um, July is my birthday month too. Like it's just going to be fun. You can keep up with me on Instagram. Like I will still be on like my personal Instagram and the podcast Instagram, which are linked down below as always. And then I also have, um, a channel where I just like post vlogs. So if you're interested in seeing what's up, it's Christian content. Like if you, you just want Christian content, definitely check that out. And I'll leave some playlists to season one. So if you're just interested in just dwelling with your sister in Christ, check that out. Oh my gosh. And I found a new show called The Promised Land, which is literally like, it's so cool. It's like the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness and in the desert, but like shot like the office. And it's literally amazing. I'm going to link that below too. And I just challenge you, just like we talked about, let the Holy Spirit speak with you in these three weeks too. Like spend time in his word as you've been doing. I pray that, that encour this encourages you to do so. And yeah, it's just been a blessing. Like I'm just happy to be here. I'm just vibing and I'm excited for season two. And I'm just ready to hear what the Lord has to say. And yeah, he was, I was like, I'm gonna post one more episode. He's like, no girl, you take it all three. You're taking all three weeks. So I'll see you on August 5th. Um, keep me in your prayers as always as I pray for you. And I'm just excited for God to do a new thing in season two. But thank you so much for being here. And I just pray that the blessing of the Lord be upon you and your families and your walks and that he would dwell with you forever and ever and ever. I do not take any of this for granted. I really don't. So yeah, I'm so blessed to be here and yeah, I don't take it for granted. I'm just grateful. I'm thankful. So I will see you in three weeks. You already know where to find me. Find me in the secret place um, or on Instagram, the podcast Instagram or my personal one. You know, I'd be happy. I'm gonna be happy somewhere. You you just got to find me or on my other channel. My nose is really runny though. Um, So I will talk to you guys in a little bit. Bye. God bless you.